Hey friends and church family, glad to have you uh, tuned in. Looking forward to our study from Luke chapter 23, verse 26 to begin with. Uh, these are, are, are powerful verses, are hard verses. Uh, we, we admire our Savior, we dread seeing him go through the ordeal. Uh, for many of us, these are our love-hate passages. We uh, know we need them, we know that God put them there for a purpose, but uh, how we love our Savior for what he's done for us. Uh, let's delve right into our study, Luke 23, again, verse 26. We're going to see the king on a cross here be introduced to a very interesting man. I want to spend some time talking about uh, kind of one of the unsung heroes of the Bible, one that uh, maybe we haven't given much thought to. Verse 26 says, Now as they led him, that's Jesus, away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on whom, or on him, they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. All right, let's do a quick rewind here. Uh, Jesus has gone through a sleepless night. There's the arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. There's the mock trials. He's been uh, before the Jews. He's been beaten more than once, uh, taken to Pontius Pilate at, at what we would call dawn, and then over to Herod, who was uh, over the jurisdiction of Galilee, sent back to Pilate. And uh, Pilate doesn't want to kill Jesus. He finds no capital offense, no charge against him meriting crucifixion, uh, and yet kind of um, uh, caters to, he cowardly uh, goes along with what the Jews insisted. They wanted him crucified. We all know that that fulfilled uh, prophecy, fulfilled scripture. Uh, and so all of these uh, events are falling into place. The dominoes are tipping at just the right time. And so uh, as we see Jesus, and remember he's been beaten, he's been scourged. The Bible doesn't go into great detail about the gory aspects of that, the inhumane treatment, uh, the, the reference to uh, the back of the person being ribbons of quivering flesh. Uh, just raw meat, to put it bluntly, uh, is what Jesus was subjected to. Many people died from the scourging. Jesus didn't, but he was in a weakened state obviously after that. So they lead him away. This is from what we know about the, uh, the topography of Jerusalem, uh, certainly that day, probably a little more than, than a half a mile away uh, from the Praetorium, Pilate's residence there. So more than a half a mile away, can you imagine? And by the way, as we think about the cross, uh, this is very likely the cross beam. This would be just the, the, the horizontal uh, wood piece, heavy, uh, I'm sure, to carry the, the weight of a man. Uh, but likely the, the post was already in the ground or they put one up later. And so when he's carrying the cross, it's not the T. It's not typically, uh, now again, that's a conjecture, although you can prove that. Uh, I know that if you've watched a movie or a film, uh, whether it has just the cross beam or whether it has the whole cross, well, that's kind of Hollywood's uh, idea or version, but most think it's a cross beam. It says that a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, there are three things that we know about him. Now, the three Gospels, the first three mention him. Uh, John just talks about Jesus uh, bearing his cross. And so evidently it's kind of a joint effort, uh, maybe not from the very first step, but, but early on when Jesus uh, is stumbling and struggling. Now, uh, there again, sometimes we, we have a picture it may be even influenced by songs. In the song, Follow Me, uh, it talks about uh, the weight, or the cross became so heavy, he fell beneath the load. Now, did Jesus do that? Very possibly. It's just that the Bible doesn't strictly say that. Wouldn't be surprising at all. Uh, but sometimes, again, we're influenced uh, maybe by songs or, uh, or Bible class books, uh, pictures we've seen uh, of that event. But here are three things we know about this Simon. We know his country. We have a reference in Mark's gospel alone to, uh, to his children. And then finally, we, we see the coincidence. Simon, in other words, did not run up before the Roman soldiers and raise his hand and say, stop the proceeding, let me help this fellow. Uh, let's, let's, don't go too hasty. Let's talk about Cyrene. Cyrene is how some uh, would pronounce it there. This is, it's in North Africa. It is, this is impressive to me, about 750 to 800 miles from Jerusalem. 
this guy did not hop a flight. He didn't uh, uh, get in a car, although that would have been a long drive. This was a, a long journey. Uh, and so Cyrene is mentioned. It's founded as a Greek colony back in 631 B.C., but Jews from uh, on the day of Pentecost are from there. Uh, uh, they figure the people, residents from this city, uh, Antioch, uh, Christians are present in the church there, poss uh, possibly Lucius, who's mentioned by name in Acts 13.1. Uh, and so this is going to be a, a prominent Bible city, although it's a long way from Jerusalem. Evidently, he is either a Jew or a convert. Uh, his name's Simon. It's a good Jewish name. Probably indicates uh, that he was a Jew. And so he's there likely for the Passover feast. And so we know about his country. We know about his children. They're called, and I'll give you this if you want to study it further, Mark 15, 21. He's the father of Alexander and Rufus. Does that help you out much? There's a Rufus mentioned in Romans chapter 16, uh, in verse 13, who is a Christian. Now, I don't know how common that name was. Obviously, there are actually nine different Simons in the New Testament. And so it's a very common name. I don't know how many Rufuses. Paul uh, admired him, bragged on him. He talks about his mother and mine, indicating uh, she's like a mother to me. Now, here's what is of note. People over the, uh, the ages, through the generations, have wondered, it, since Simon is mentioned by name, even his sons, you, you don't have a reference to the, the children of Pilate, Herod, the chief priest. Well, we know uh, Caiaphas and Annas, but, but the idea is if this wasn't an important person, if he didn't factor in the story of Jesus later, probably just would have said they compelled a man. I'm going to suggest that the name Simon, even indicating uh, children, two of them at least, Alexander and Rufus, probably indicates that after this encounter, they became Christians, possibly on the day of Pentecost, uh, just uh, 51 days from, from what's happening right here. Now, can't prove that. Uh, don't know for sure, but uh, one of those things, if it's imperative that we know, we will find out certainly in eternity. So let's go from the children there to the coincidence. When it says that they compelled uh, or laid hold of a, a certain man uh, coming from the, the country, all right, he's, he's maybe dwelling or uh, living there, just walking into town there. Uh, look at the coincidence. Again, he didn't volunteer for the job. Now, let's talk about the word compel. In Matthew 5, 41, you'll know that is located in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught this, whoever compels you to go a mile with him, go with him two miles. Whoever compels you. We, we see the root word compelled in the word compulsion. Here's something that is mandatory. I have to do it. There's a must involved, not a matter of option, or, uh, but it's rather obligation. The, the Roman soldiers could compel uh, others, they could compel a Roman citizen. They compel, obviously, strangers. You must take my baggage, my pack, sometimes pretty heavy with their equipment. You have to, in our, our way of translating the distance, a mile. It would be stadia for them. And so they would even have the roads kind of marked off, kind of like our mile markers. You go down some interstates, and not only do you see the mile, but you see two tenths. Uh, and so they would have those marked. So a soldier, for no reason other than he's just tired or he's, he's just bored, he could say, hey, you, carry my baggage. I'm walking here. You carry it. And you had an option. You could either say, yes, I will carry it, or no, I won't. Now, if you chose the latter option, no, I'm not going to carry your baggage, uh, you probably just entitled yourself to an early death. They, they could kill you. Some of them would be that callous. And so, no, you took this as a serious obligation. Under the power of Rome, as if it were from the Caesar himself, this is an imperative for you. And then in Matthew 5, remember how Jesus says, don't stop at one, no, go two. Yeah, mess with their minds. Do something that, that indicates an attitude different in you that's not going to uh, kind of scowl and, and fuss the whole way and and drop that, uh, that bag in a huff once you got to the, the very inch 
uh, where the end was. No, go, go to. Jesus is, is picturing here a, a revolutionary way of living there. Uh, but back to Simon here. Simon, hey, you. Maybe just randomly out of the crowd. You. Uh, maybe he's strong or, or something like that. Help this condemned criminal, Jesus, the one they're treating as a condemned, help him uh, to, to Golgotha or to Calvary. Now, nothing is said about whether Simon uh, liked the chore, if he looked at it merely as duty, if he didn't know about Jesus, and, and so was, was just shocked by the whole thing. And, uh, and with the blood and the gore that would have been a part of how Jesus presented himself at the time, really was thinking, that's not the, the day that I had pictured. Here's a holy day. It's Friday. Passover is here. And so he's thinking, I'm going to be unclean. It's going to mess up my feast plans. My family, if we, uh, we're going to be together, you know what? Man, what a bad day. Perhaps he, Simon, as he's carrying that cross beam with and for Jesus, sees something unusual. He hears the taunts of the crowd. He hears Jesus in a moment speak to the women. Maybe he's putting two and two together and realizing this guy's unusual. Something mysterious and marvelous about Jesus, perhaps he stayed during the execution and heard those seven sayings of Jesus and witnessed a remarkable transformation. If he were one of those, let's, let's play this. If he were one of those waiting for the Messiah, he had an expectation about God coming and doing something special through an, an anointed and an appointed leader, maybe he's thinking, this is the guy. This Jesus that they're condemning as a criminal, although I, I see nothing that he's done wrong, maybe he's the one who's going to be the Savior. Regardless of how all that played down, here's what we know. He bore the cross of Jesus. He helped to carry the cross beam that finally when they get to the place, Romans would take over from there, that would be the instrument of the death of Jesus. Now, here's an interesting thing. Jesus bore the cross for us. Simon, had he been crucified with Jesus, his blood would not have uh, saved anyone. It would not have made any soul uh, whitened or clean. He couldn't do that, could he? So think about the irony here. Simon bore the cross intended for Jesus. Jesus really still had to bear it in the sense of being nailed to it and dying on it. And so he bore that cross for Simon too. He did something for Simon that maybe wasn't appreciated on that day, and that is, I'm going to die so that everybody, anybody, Simon, you and your sons, and your, you can be saved on the basis of what I've done. I can't help but think about just how that day would, would have been just emblazoned in his mind as a magnificent day, a sad day, but maybe assuming he converts he could tell people that story, and maybe relay things that he saw and heard um, attending the, the crucifixion of our Savior. And so with just a, a smattering of verses here, just three verses really, uh, there's enough to pique our interest and make us want to, to yearn to know more, certainly, uh, about him. Jesus bore our sins in his own body. First uh, Peter 2, 24, Christ uh, Hebrews 9 uh, verse 28 says, was offered once to bear the sins of many. And what Jesus, remember, even in, in Luke, our focal study uh, this time, he talks about if anyone comes after me and does not uh, deny himself and take up his cross, follow me, cannot be my disciple. What does it mean that I bear my cross? Do I literally have to die, be crucified? Do I go up uh, to a Roman soldier or a soldier of another country and say, hey, nail me to this thing, punish me until I die. No, Jesus was talking about a figurative, a symbolic uh, death, a, a self-denial, a decision to, to live for him, to, to let the one, the only one who could save us, be the ruler, to be Lord over our lives. And, and all the unpleasant things that literally would have attended a crucifixion I need to forego 
uh, those, those conveniences sometimes. I need to realize uh, being a Christian is going to cost something. It's not always going to be easy. And there will be the similar things, not to the degree Jesus suffered, but a similar uh, uh, having people turn their back on us, uh, being unpopular in the, the eyes of the world, having a message that goes against the grain. These are part of the things that attend the cross-bearing, I believe, that, that we as his followers uh, uh, go through. Back in 2005, there was a, a train wreck, in fact, a bad one in California. It was fatal. Several people died in that train wreck. And during the course of it, there was a man badly injured who felt like that he probably would die. He was bleeding profusely. And he did something, uh, I don't know how you would take this, but, but in his own blood, he wrote, I don't know if it was on the wall or the floor, a chair or something like that, the seat, he wrote to his family, I love you in his own blood. Now, if you like happy endings, you, you might be happy to know he didn't die. They, they were able to rescue him, save him, keep him from bleeding out. Uh, and yet, imagine being his family, seeing a picture if they snapped that of him. The message from this man thinking, anticipating, I'm going to die, and in my blood I'm writing you a message, an enduring one, I love you. I use that illustration to say, Jesus, more than just I, I possibly could die, I think am I not really sure, chose a very painful method of execution. And in his blood, he did literally with a finger right out on a cross beam or in the dirt, I love you to me and to you. But you see, that's what the, the powerful message, the John 3.16 message is. I love you. And I did have to die. There was no other plan. It was either him or us. And Jesus thought we were worth saving, not because we are worthy, but because he loves us. What a marvel Calvary is to us. What a magnificent thing the, the sacrifice of our Savior is. Let's go just a little bit further here. Now we could even say more about Simon, and about uh, this, uh, this couple of verses here. Verse 27 says, A great multitude of the people followed him, and women also who mourned and lamented him. You know, thinking about the Christ and the cross-bearer, Simon, uh, and now some in the crowd. You see, not everyone was jeering. Not everyone was, uh, was kind of laughing and mocking him on the way to uh, the Calvary there on, on the Via Dolorosa. There were one sympathizing with them, the women and the people, in like fact, a great multitude. They were dreading what was going to happen. They, they I'm sure, shuddered uh, to see how different Jesus was compared to maybe the last time they'd seen him. Here, watch what Jesus says to them, daughters of Jerusalem. Now, that tells me, among other things, when it says that Women mourned and lamented. There's a great multitude. Most of them probably are women. Not the apostles, other than John. Uh, not uh, some of the other ones who've been faithful to him. The women, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Now that's amazing. What are you crying for me about? Weep for yourselves and for your children. Watch what he says. Here's another prediction for the future. He's kind of... Uh, um, opening a, a window to, to what's going to happen. Verse 29, indeed the days are coming in which they will say, blessed are the barren wombs that never bore breasts which never nursed. What in the world is he saying? Women often in every society, every generation have associated motherhood with a, a blessing, a good thing. And you read about those women that were sometimes permanently and often temporarily barren if they're mentioned because a, a birth, a wondrous birth is going to take place. But Jesus says it'd be better off if you didn't have kids. Why? Because if you have children and with that strong emotional bond and attachment, you're going to lose them. They're going to lose you. And so the grief from that through, I'm assuming, persecution, uh, the martyrdom that would... Uh, uh, befall a lot of the Christians is what he's anticipating. He quotes from uh, Hosea 10, verse 8, 
they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? Jesus, not even thinking about his own pains and his misery and his suffering, says, you know what, I actually, I feel bad for you. I think he's at least saying, you know what, this is a terrible day. It's a dark day, and yet it's going to be a day of great light when you understand what my sacrifice means for you. But even then, with the commitment to me, it's going to be hard days coming. There will be difficult days ahead. Jesus had to be honest enough even to share uh, that information with, with the ones who had shown an amazing commitment and faithfulness to him. This Sunday night, Lord willing, we'll continue. In Luke 23, we'll be there in verse 32. We're going to look at those famous thieves, those infamous thieves. Maybe you want to think about them. Lessons we can learn uh, about them and uh, some of those sayings from the cross. Look forward to studying with you. Thank you for tuning in uh, to, at this session. It's hard to say tonight. You may be watching in, in the daytime. Again, I love you. Thank, for, thank you for uh, your membership at Hartsville Pike and, and what you mean. Appreciate comments and, and hearing from some of you that are tuning in. God bless and have a good rest of your day.